I often um, describe the job of a director as being the surgeon, you know, in a room and the musical, which is an organism hell bent on self destruction, I think. And I'm like, sort of help get trying to make sure everyone is keeping this fucking thing alive. I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. You're listening to the Producers Perspective Podcast with your host, Tony Award winner, Ken Davenport. Hey everybody, it's Ken Davenport. Before we get to Michael Mayer and his terrific stories about the tech of Thoroughly Modern Millie and all about Neil Patrick Harris and Hedwig and the Angry Inch, uh, let me just ask you one favor if you are enjoying these podcasts. You are enjoying these podcasts, yes? If so, do me a favor and leave us a nice big review on the old iTunes or whatever platform you're using. It helps so much promote the theater and, of course, promote our guests, which is what it's all about. It encourages more people to listen and, therefore, more guests will show up and tell all their Broadway secrets just for you. So do us a favor again, uh, give us five stars on iTunes, write a nice comment, and share it with your friends. Thanks so much, and now on with Michael Mayer. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Producer's Perspective podcast. My name is Ken Davenport. So I first met today's guest when I was the company manager of Thoroughly Modern Millie on Broadway. It was my very first company manager gig on Broadway. Uh, and he, of course, was the director. Please welcome to the podcast, Mr. Michael Mayer. Welcome, Michael. Thanks. Thanks, Ken. Good to be here. So Michael, of course, directed that Millie. He helped turn that show into the Tony Award-winning best musical that it is, and we're going to talk about that because that was a fascinating few weeks of my life. I can't imagine yours. Uh, he won a Tony Award for the original Spring Awakening. He has also directed Sideman, American Idiot, The Revival of Hedwig, the current production of Burn This, which is getting great reviews. Almost 20 Broadway shows in total. I will not go through them all, uh, and we'll just start with this. So, Michael, where did you fall in love with the theater? I think I first understood what theater was and fell in love with it when I was about eight years old and I was watching TV in Washington, D.C., where I grew up, uh, on Channel 5, black and white TV, and there was a movie on called Babes in Arms with Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland, and it was the first of those Let's Put on a Show movies. And so these two amazing, talented kids put on the show. It was like a giant block party kind of thing it was like um, you know it was MGM it was this the idea that that was theater is what you know that was the first image of a theater that I had um, and so I started doing I was like let's put on a show so I started doing The Wizard of Oz and things like and Oliver in my backyard with friends and my cousins and brother and sister and in the basement. So I was just always, like from a very young age, making little musicals and little plays. Were you directing them? Were I was you? directing, I was writing them, I was acting in them, you know, I was singing. It was, you know, it was kind of like a one-man show with other people in it. <laughs> and so did you follow the trajectory of a performer? Yeah, yeah? I did. Yeah, that's what it, but that, that was really the only option um, where I grew up in the suburbs there there was like a drama club in junior high and in high school and that's where you know I did you you could do plays there and musicals occasionally um, and that's that was my dream it was to was to be an actor why don't you know this is a, a bit of a side note but your your director of the drama club was the teacher or, yeah right? uh-huh why don't they let kids direct some of this stuff to get well, training, to start training early. Well, I don't know that most kids know what directing is, really. It is, at least I didn't know I was directing. I just thought I was facilitating this thing to happen because I wanted it to happen. Um, but I will say that in in high school, my um, the late, great Stephen Perry Alice, who was our uh, drama teacher, he just died this year at age ninety two or 95 or something um, he did a, there was a one act play festival every year and the students directed in that and I did one of those once so you, you said when you're a kid you don't really know what directing is yeah. now that you're not a kid yeah. except that hard <laughs> you're a kid what is directing to you now what does it mean well directing is um, I don't know it's so many different things really I feel like you know you start 
you, you, you know, you're a storyteller. I think all of us in the theater are storytellers, and we each have our, you know, we each have our role in terms of how the story gets told. Um, and I feel like my responsibility as a director is twofold. One, I feel like I'm really directing the audience. I'm telling the audience where to look, how to experience the story, what's important, what's funny, what's serious, what you know, um, how to how to enter, how to enter the world of the story, and um, to the best of my ability, make them have you know manipulate them a little bit into having a particular experience. The other half of it is to work with all of the tools that I have, which are actors and designers and space and energy, you know, and an audience. So I think that's, you know, you come from, from both ends, from the audience and from the stage, and whatever happens between what's on the stage and in the audience, that amazing, electric, magical ephemera that is that's the, that's the part that's outside of my control. I just hope for the best and make these two things happen together. And you know whatever that is, you know night by night is is its own special you know thing, the special sauce or whatever. So of all the different tools that you work with, and work mm-hmm. with writers and actors and designers and mm-hmm. uh, etc. What and that, directors can be great at many different facets of those what's Mm -hmm. what's your favorite tool to work with like are you a designer person a writer person director and what do you think you're best at gosh you know right you know i always think i'm best at nothing you know i always feel like such a fraud all the time every time i start a new project i'm like oh god i really should have filled out that nursing school application 25 years ago um really done something and done something useful with my life sure even I with still, all the accolades and the say you get twenty Broadway shows in your absolutely, resume. I still feel that way. I still feel like you know, uh, some kind of like you know, like a faker. You know? So what do you? Okay, so but, it, so I don't. I I would say that like on different projects, I could tell you what I thought I did well and what I thought my strong you know my strong suit was. I will say that, and maybe it's just because I've, I've just opened Burn This which was probably the least technically complicated thing that I've done in eons. And I had a, a wonderful script by a writer who is no longer with us. And yeah, I had fantastic designers, but to me the great joy of this project was working with these four extraordinary actors. And so the elemental nature of just dealing with four people in a room and the scene work and the depth of that and creating a journey for each of them and all the five of us kind of working together to sculpt the the arc of the play and to find the right tone and to to sort of bring the audience to uh, a 1987 New York that doesn't exist anymore all of that was incredibly gratifying I'll leave it to other people to say whether, you know, I did well, but I will tell you that it was, um, it was a lot of fun and it was really hard. So let's compare that to Thoroughly Modern Millie. Let's just go back, way back, Mm -hmm. (laughs) in terms of what you did well on that. Because for, for a lot of people who don't know, so Thoroughly Modern Millie wins Best Musical. It's being done all over the world now. It's so, so popular. But it had a very troubled preview period. I mean, look, I've I've said this before, and what, but you probably don't even know this. Nina Landon and I, after that first first preview, general manager Nina and and I, and I was the company manager, and she was my boss. And after the first preview and the audience response and everything, we looked at each other and we were like, I don't know if we're gonna have a job in several weeks. Like, it was not it was not where it ended up being. And then I've never seen a creative team work so hard at getting it to where it was going to be and ends up winning Best Musical over yeah. years. So what did you do on that show that you obviously did so well? Well, I will say that um, I think I brought together or helped bring together a really superb 
group of artists who were absolutely dedicated to making that, that thing work. I often um, describe the job of a director as being the surgeon, you know, in a room and the musical, which is an organism hell bent on self destruction, I think. It's just such an unnatural thing. It should not be alive. And we're all there, and it's, we're in, you know, it, we're in the OR, and I'm the, you know, I'm the head surgeon, basically, and mm -hmm. I'm like, sort of help get trying to make sure everyone is keeping this fucking thing alive to the extent that my my presence was useful to all of these different artists i think that it was to just keep everyone focused on making sure that 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 millie lived and thrived in whatever way she could, you know what I mean? And we had so many. I mean, we had lots of things uh, that were going against us. Ken, do you remember? Wasn't it? Wasn't it the first preview that the? Um, wasn't it the first preview the sprinklers went? Yes, the deluge curtain. The opened. deluge curtain opened. And it's so funny you say that because I was at the theater because I got called over there, and I will never forget your face when you came in and we had to tell you. That I know. Was, you I'm, lost a day of tech. We lost. It was the la yeah. It was was that the last day of tech or? It was very close. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Way, uh, I couldn't believe it. And they had to rebuild some of the scenery that got destroyed. The deluge curtain. I mean, who ever even heard of such a thing? That happened. And then I think I don't know how many performances in we were before Gavin Creel blew out his knee and he was out for three weeks. They said that he might be out for more, but he got back up and in the show like just in time for those critics' performances. It was unbelievable. And then all these things we kept trying. Someone was just reminding me the other day of the trash can. Do you remember that one time we had, there was a prop we had made and the trash can would sort of come on stage um, and uh, Jimmy, Millie, you know, Millie threw her shoe away. You know, she the 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 the, the, um, the she gets mugged, right? And she loses her shoe and the the, the and Gavin, you know, playing Jimmy, that walks on and is singing about her, and this trash can comes on stage, and he finds her shoe, and he's, we, there was like the Cinderella kind of element to it that lasted one performance, and that was the end of that. The, the head surgeon took a scalpel. To yes, that, that was Cut. gone, and then there there were, there were several other scenes and bits that we had, and there was a whole. I just remember this. There was a, the floor of the Hotel Priscilla, you know, upstairs, and all these doors opening and closing to show time passing. And Janine had written this really complicated music. It was almost like a ballet. And they would pop out and go, Monday, and then little things would happen Tuesday. <laughs> that lasted one performance, I think. Yeah, so. <laughs> You guys, but I, I, we had a great, I will say that the support we got from the producers was extraordinary. And uh, Dick Scanlon and Janine Tesori were just ferocious in terms of their dedication to making everything better and better and better and better. And we had a, a really unbelievable cast. They were all real troopers. So when you got started in, in directing, what, what was your big break? Where Was there a moment where you're like, oh, I'm getting some visibility now, and all of a sudden things are happening? I guess the... Yeah, I guess my big break, I think pretty clearly, was when I directed a production of Perestroika for, at the NYU graduate acting program, which was my alma mater. But I hadn't been back there in years. I started, when I started, when I shifted from acting to directing, Ron Van Loo, who was running the program at the time, the acting program, called me in as a replacement director a couple times, and it, I, I seemed to get along pretty well with everyone there, and so I started, I, I came back, I was doing a production of Hay Fever with the third year, and it was right when Angels in America was going to open on Broadway, and Tony Kushner, whom I met in 1981 in at NYU, he was in the directing program, and I was in the acting program, we became fast friends. Um, and he'd gone on and to become this wonderful writer. And, and this was Angel's first time in New York City. And it had opened both parts in L.A. And 
the second part was received less gloriously than the first. And I think that the Broadway producers were reticent to go right into rehearsal with Perestroika because they thought it needed lots of rewrites. So they're doing Millennium on Broadway, and Tony asked me if I would do a workshop production of Perestroika downtown at NYU with these actors. And he would be there working with us and developing the script. He never really was around much. He came by a couple times, but for very brief episodes, because he really was consumed with Millennium on Broadway. So I was, I just did basically the L.A. version of Perestroika that nobody thought really was strong enough. And I had an incredible cast of young actors. Deborah Messing was my Harper, and Ben Shankman was Roy Cohn, and Vivian Benish was Hannah. I mean, it was really... Uh, Daniel Zellman was prior. It was a really good, good group. And everybody came to see it because it was Angel's Fever. And once word got out that there was this little lab production downtown, you had to fight to get in. It was a little room, about 100 seats, and down on 2nd Avenue. And we did about, I think, six or seven performances. And to this day, I will still hear from people like artistic directors or playwrights who were, or producers who were in that audience and say that was such an amazing performance and that I really am convinced that's what um, shifted things for me. And certainly from in terms of scale because it was after that that Margot Lyon and the other Broadway producers of Angels asked me to direct the national tour to do my own production because George Wolfe had just been appointed to run the public theater. So he went from the Broadway Angels to the public and I went from this little student production of Perestroika to directing both parts in a national tour, which was a, a huge deal. Was it difficult for you to make the transition from acting to directing? No. I feel like I looked in the mirror one day and I just had, it was like a little come to Jesus moment with myself. I had auditioned for all of those Neil Simon plays, right? Like Biloxi Blues, Brighton Beach, Broadway Bound, I auditioned. They kept bringing me in for the tour, for the understudies for the tour, for the, you know, bus and truck to, you know, a non-equity production up in, you know, Schenectady or whatever. You know, I kept auditioning for these things. And I was, at the time, I was, you know, in my mid-twenties, and I had, I very much was like a Matthew Broderick type, although actually Jewish, and I couldn't book them. And I think that I had to realize that if I'm not getting this kind of part, then there's there's really a problem that I have to face, because I don't know that I want to live the life of an unemployed actor. It's hard to be that objective, though, when you're young. But I think this is why I was, ultimately, I was a director, because I wouldn't cast myself. You know, I'm looking and I'm going like, you know, they're better people. So I'm kind of ruthless, maybe. And I also feel like, and this is not to disparage any of the, any of the directors that I worked with through my life as an actor, but I, I had a kind of awareness that I could do as well as they did. I didn't feel like I had, with I would say with the exception of Kushner, who directed me a few times in his plays, I hadn't ever worked with a director who I thought really was so amazing. I thought, well, I could do that. I mean, literally, I'm like that. The bar was so low that I felt great confidence that I could achieve at least that level of proficiency. And you had gone to school for acting, mm-hmm. so now you decide you're going to be a director. Yeah. Do you embark on some training program to be a director? Like, what did you do? I had had it with training programs at that point. I just started, you know, I can't remember the first thing I did. I, was, I had a friend who wanted to do a play. She'd made some money doing commercials, and she hadn't been able to do a play in a long time. And she said, let's do a play, and you can direct it. You know, because I told her, this is what I'm going to do now. 
So we did a production of The Maids by Genet down at River West Theater. It ran for two weeks, I think, two weekends. Some people, some friends came. I, I don't think it was very good. But it was, a, you know, it was hard. I took on a real challenge. I had an idea about it that I think was probably a crackpot idea. But at least, you know, there was some thought behind it. And I had designers and... I had my first design meetings making that thing, and it had, it definitely had, there was a take. It had a real, it had a look and a feel, and it had a score. I had um, this guy I knew, who's long gone now, named Andrew Nadelson. He used to work with the Living Theater, and he was a composer, got his doctorate of composition from Columbia, and he wrote a score that we recorded, and... (laughs) It was this whole thing. This is so crazy. We literally would the, the stage manager would push the button on play, and the entire show was underscored. So it was every night. It was exactly the same length because the actors knew that this cue, this music would cue this line. It was crazy, Ken. But but you know, I tried it. It was a it was a wacky idea. And then I did a few other things. One of which was uh, was Cloud Nine. Um, somehow we got the rights to do a production of Cloud Nine, and we all like painted the sets together and stuff. Ran for five nights down on Eleventh Avenue and Twenty Second Street, the Sanford Meisner Theater it was called, and people really loved Cloud Nine, and it hadn't been in New York since that um, Tommy Toon production. So people showed up for that. They came and saw it, and I will say I I did a really terrific job on it. I don't know I I didn't have a giant plan ahead of time but I went in and I connected with the material and I had some wonderful actors and we we did a good job and the audiences really loved it and there were a couple people like Morgan Janess who's now an agent but she was at the time the dramaturg at both uh, the public and at New York Theatre Workshop and so she called to have a meeting after that, and she was like, this is, she saw something in me, and she was very encouraging, and it was that kind of thing. So you, you didn't have a big plan for that. It turns out to be something that you're very proud of. Yeah. Do you, does that change for each show? Some shows, do you have a big plan and lots of research, and some you're like, all right, we're going to get in there and just play? Well, I did a lot of research, but, but because it was, again, it was kind of an empty stage, this is what we could afford. We couldn't afford like sets and stuff. So we painted the whole room green, and I had a wicker um, love seat. That was the and a and a and, and a, a like a an, a Persian rug or something like that. That was the whole set. And in the second act, there was a park bench. I mean, that's it. It was nothing. So I was I was very good, I guess, at the relationships with the actors. I guess that's my, I have to say, I'm not thinking about it back to your first question. That's where it begins and ends. And it's also what my training is. My training is acting. And even if I wasn't a great actor, I definitely understand what the process is and how to talk to actors and, how, and what their experience of creating work is. So you fall in love with a big, splashy MGM musical on television, <laughs> and then you're mm. directing just a g- all-green park bench, right? Yeah. and then you're doing serious plays, you're doing perestroika. Uh-huh. What Do you like musicals better than plays, plays better than musicals? Well, I love musicals. Um, I think that... I love it all. I mean, this is the problem with me. I've never... Like, my whole career has been the most eclectic... Um, collection of of stuff, you know, and I keep going from one, like, from an opera to a film to um, a a play to a musical to, you know, so that has been really rewarding, and it certainly keeps me on my toes, right? I don't, I'm not doing the same thing over and over again, but I, I do feel like when a musical works, there's kind of nothing better. You know, there that there is nothing more satisfying than sending an audience out on that cloud of helium that they get from a, from a great musical. Do you feel that after Spring Awakening? Well, maybe not helium. 
<laughs> Spring Awakening was a little of... different. It was dark. But and American Idiot too. Both of those were dark, but I definitely feel like audiences left those two shows very full of uh, the possibility of what a musical could do. And I feel like they were all they were charged. You know, it, you can feel it. it. It's an exciting, very exciting thing. And I think a lot of it is also when you see an audience discover new talent. That's a Real, and I feel like just uh, well. No, I've done plays where I've discovered people as well. But there's something really fun about that I love about finding new talent. Like to bring Sutton Foster to Broadway in Millie when she was the understudy at La Jolla. You know, to have a you know a no name. I mean, really, like she'd done some stuff, but no one really knew who she was. Well, you've helped birth a number of stars. Yeah. Sutton and Leia, of course, and John. I mean, Jonathan it's... Groff and Kristen Chenoweth. Right, and Charlie Brown. And Charlie Brown. And Alice and Janney had her first leading role in my view from the bridge with Anthony LaPaglia. So and, what's the difference know. between working with someone like a Sutton before she's Sutton uh-huh. and then Neil Patrick Harris and mm-hmm. Hedwig? Is one more challenging than the other? What's it like working with those No, you know, they're both fantastic. So with Sutton, um, I think uh, she... God, that was such a... You know, it was so much drama getting to that point where she had the role. It was an undeniable thing that when we saw her in in rehearsal and she had to step in because our, um, our leading lady had been ill... And you just see someone sort of, and not claim the role in some in any kind of like all about Eve kind of way at all, but just someone who was born to do that. It was like destiny. She had to play this part. And you just basically get out of the way when you see that kind of thing. And help, you know, and just help. And she had a lot of, um, I think she was, I think she was very secure in the things that she knew she could do and I think she was insecure in the things she didn't know she could do and working with her I think we all worked very passionately and carefully together to help her feel like secure we knew that she was going to nail it but I think she needed to uh, be reassured throughout it because it was a huge responsibility on this kid to like carry that whole show I mean the show is a wonderful and it has demonstrated it's a wonderful show but she really I mean she's not off stage for more than a few minutes and how did you get that performance out of Neil Neil I I had this when you know David Binder had been talking to me about doing Hedvig a, a Broadway Hedvig for a while I was actually meant to be the original director of the off-Broadway version but I got a, another show happened so I, I couldn't do it um, so I felt like I had a date with Hedvig for like 20 years. As soon as he told me he wanted to do it, and not with John, he didn't want to open it on Broadway with John Cameron Mitchell, he wanted to get like a big star. And I immediately thought of Neil. He was on How I Met Your Mother at the time. And I knew him a little bit. I met him when he was doing a play at the Atlantic a long time ago, and I was doing a play there. Um, I just had this hunch that this that he would be able to access parts of himself that weren't hadn't weren't sanctioned by his public at that point. You know, he was playing that guy on um, that guy Barney on TV, super hetero and kind of a uh, kind of a you know chauvinist pig type guy. And but I know who Neil really is. And not that he is head vague at all, but I knew he could access parts of that. And I thought that that would be amazing. And I basically begged everyone to wait for him to be done with his TV show. I thought it, I thought it would be worth the wait. Um, it certainly was. And I was. I, I think that it was, it was amazing. And I'd love to work with him again on something totally different now. I think that would be... I think that's that would be a very cool thing to see him now turn the dial in a in a very different direction. So unfortunately, all shows can't be as successful artistically and actually commercially. Right. Like uh-huh. you know, what right. what do you do 
when a show doesn't live up to even your expectations and you walk out going? It's weird, you know, we, ha we live in a world now, and this was not the way it was when I was um, growing up and when I first came to New York. Like, the box office numbers weren't news. You'd open the arts section. You wouldn't read. You wouldn't know, like, what... You'd have to get variety. I mean, you'd have to really be interested in the business element. You'd have to go and look at it to find out. It wasn't, you know, there was no online thing. You know, there was nothing. There was no online. There was no internet. But so you'd have to buy variety and read it. to see, So you'd have to be really invested, literally, I think, in in the, in the business of show business to know what was successful and what wasn't. And now that's that's as much, and sometimes even more, of the news. I mean, the New York Times, like, what are the top ten grossing shows on Broadway every week? And it's, it's like, who, like, on one level, like, who cares? Like, what's interesting? What's good? What's a performance that shouldn't be missed? What is, what is, is someone trying to do with some, anyway, the, you know, I'm just preaching to the choir, I know. But unsuccess or lack of success, failure, flops, shows that don't work. There are so many different ways to define what that is. And, you know, you could easily say a show is a flop because it didn't make its money back. But was it? No, maybe it was, maybe it was really great. Maybe audiences loved it. Maybe it was pushing the envelope in some way. Maybe it achieved exactly what the creators wanted it to achieve. Isn't that a success? Whether it runs forever or not? I don't know. I mean, I've certainly done things that um, I was very proud of that didn't have a, a long life or didn't make money. Certain, like recently, like Head Over Heels, for instance, I was really proud of that show. I think that we achieved a, um, a huge percentage of what we set out to do, and it was a, and it was tricky. We, it was a hard assignment. I thought that it was artful and funny and heartfelt, and I thought the songs sounded amazing, and I thought the cast rocked it every night. That ensemble was amazing. When we had great performances, and it was really fresh. People didn't want to see it. What can you do? You can't make them see it. Do I feel like it was a failure? Not at all. I feel like that was a, a that was an artistic triumph. I think for all of us who worked on it, we felt great about it. We were just sad that um, that it didn't have more of a life. But then there are shows that are flops and they don't work, and you have to acknowledge that. And that feels terrible because everyone's trying to make good work. Um, I don't really ever think about what's commercial and what isn't. So if I gave you the list of shows that I passed on or decided to take myself out of the running for or read 30 pages and thought, eh, it's not for me, you know, in other people's hands they have become gigantic antic hits some of them are still running so I don't think about money that way I don't think about plays as, and musicals in a commercial way once it's up and running or once you're doing it you can't help it and you really want it to because there's something so especially in today's world it's um, so public and there is a humiliation factor that comes with having a show that doesn't run and it's devastating you know but on so many levels and I think the public element of it is that thing that is that's extra specially um, awful because you gotta you know you show up the next day and you're on the street and you're making something else and everyone's going oh hi and it's that awful you know that awful feeling where no, you get no phone calls, no emails after an opening. You're like, oh, dear. So I don't read reviews. Yeah, I haven't. My next question yeah. was going to be, no, do I you haven't, read them? I, I haven't read reviews since 1995. Was there a review that made you stop? I read a review of a, a show that I did at the Vineyard, and it was, it was a pretty 
pretty good review. And in particular, things that I had contributed that might not seem like they were in the purview of the director were praised, um, and my name was not mentioned in the review at all. And I thought, all right, this is a, it's a pretty good review. Not great, not a great review, but a pretty good review. Um, and they don't even know what a director does. So I don't actually need to read this anymore. So I stopped. But you can always tell. And I get that, you know, I want to know basically, not not words. I don't like having those those phrases in my head. Um, but I, I like to know, like, if one of my cast gets creamed or something, I want to be sensitive and um, show up and be supportive. And I always, after an opening, I'm always at the theater the next day, no matter what. I encourage everyone not to look at them and just to play their show and, you know, but they, you know, you sort of feel these things, you know. How has directing changed since when you started and now? Anything you have to do differently? Anything that I have to do differently? Yeah. Um, well, it's just weird that I work on Broadway because that was never my goal. You know, I sort of, when I started directing, I was right, you know, I was short up, shortly after NYU um, grad acting. We were all very arty, you know, so my thing was like to do like, you know, sort of experimental theater downtown or do classics, reimagined classics at arena stage or at the Guthrie. I mean, that's never been my life. I ended up doing stuff in New York at great theaters like Playwrights Horizons and Roundabout and New York Theater Workshop and, and Second Stage and then and Broadway, you know, it's in the vineyard, you know. So I didn't, I ended up on Broadway and because everything is so expensive now, you have to, as a director, you have to be responsible fiscally in a way that is different. I definitely feel that that pressure. And I feel like you also, in terms of casting, which is probably the single biggest contribution a director makes to any production is who is in it. Um, that is now a very different world. You can do a new musical on Broadway without a star. That's what you can do on Broadway without a star. That's it. You can't do a play. You can't do a revival of anything without a star. Maybe Oklahoma, if they we'll see if they if they if they pull it off, you know, it becomes like you know, a big hit. I don't, you know, the reviews are great. I haven't seen it yet, but I hear it's really wonderful. As um, I, uh, but to your point, Oklahoma is almost such a star. You would think, right? So we'll but see. you never, you don't know. So, but if that, I think, is the biggest for a director. Because casting is what you, you know, that's really, that's how you, that's how you say what your show is. So... Okay, my last question, which is my genie question. I oh. want you to imagine that the genie from Aladdin comes to visit you uh -huh. and thanks you for your contributions to the theater and wants to grant you one wish. What's the one thing about working on Broadway that drives you absolutely bonkers, that makes you angry, like turning up tables, screaming, that you would ask this genie to wish away that you never have to deal with ever again? It's three things, but it's all connected. Great. The genie is feeling very liberal today with its wishes, so go for it. Drinks, snacks, and cell phones. Get rid of them. If I could do anything, I would have some sort of magic. You go through the door, and all that shit would be taken away from you and put somewhere else, and it would be magically restored to you when you left that would be that's like I'm feeling that really strongly this the, these days yeah did you get a lot of that and burn this well it's a p quiet play right yeah. there's lots of silence in there and it's not just the phones going off and it isn't just the people crinkling their candies and stuff 
there's this new thing that is making me super crazy, which is phones dropping onto the floor. And for some reason, at the Hudson Theater, like my, my associate director and I, Nick, we count. We sit there and it's like, and it's like nine or ten in act one. Phones falling, and in act two, they fall. And I don't know why people can't put their phones away. Because they're, the unfortunate thing is they're probably texting, and they're trying not to, and then they drop them. It's disgusting. No phones, no drinking, no eating. Like, what happened to people? What, what happened to us? Like, we used to be able to go, you could go, and you could go to a play, and you could actually sit there and watch the play for an hour and a half, even, without shoving something in your mouth or without reading something on your screen. I think it's pathetic. That is my biggest pet peeve. I was just at a show where the woman next to me was texting and, and looking at her phone. She put it away. She looked, and I finally said to her, can you please not do that? And she's, oh, oh. And then she said, I had an emergency. And I said, then leave. Leave, exactly. <laughs> if it's that much of an emergency, then yeah. what are you doing watching yeah. a musical right now? I just can't. And, you know, I've, been to, I've done a fair amount of work um, it, with uh, that invite that sort of attracts an audience that isn't necessarily the most um, typical theater goers. I mean, even burn this, you know, um, Adam uh, Driver, even though he's from the theater, and Carrie Russell, both, you know, their fans aren't necessarily theater goers. So they're not hip to um, everything that's, you know, the, the, the quietude of it all. But truly, it's not just them. I mean, it really is every single show. And if you're doing a loud rock musical, like American Idiot, it didn't matter. People could be talking on their phone. No one would know because the, it was such a loud, immersive thing that uh, you could, you, it, it wouldn't disturb anyone. But um, Spring Awakening or the quiet moments of Hedvig when phones would go off, it was a nightmare. It's a great, great wish, yeah. and hopefully this technology will be created in yeah. the next Did you ever hear, hear Hal Luftig's great cell phone story? No. He's, so he's at the Marquee, this a few years ago, and <laughs> you should get him to tell it because he, it's brilliant, but uh, there's this lady um, in front of him, and in the middle of Act One, her cell phone rings, and it rings again, and she pulls it out of her purse, and she answers it. And she slides the thing over and she says, Hello? I can't talk. I'm at the theater. Cape Man. Eh. <laughs> there it is. Word of mouth being spread right there in the middle of Act One. Right, yeah. Well, thank you so much for that. Uh, thanks for doing this. It means a lot. And thanks to all of you out there for listening. We will see you on the next one. <laughs>